So the, the RICE project, um, which is called the Roosevelt Island Climate Evolution Project, or second of RICE, is a climate study. And what we're doing is we're using a record of the past by analysing ice to understand better the climate behaviour under changing conditions that we expect for the future. So one of the big concerns that we have is the stability of West Antarctica. West Antarctica holds the equivalent of about six to seven metres of sea level rise. And should West Antarctica collapse, we would see over a certain time period that water contributing to the global oceans and rise sea level. What the RICE project is trying to achieve is determining how quickly this could happen and how quickly and how much water could be contributed to global sea level. So the Ross Ice Shelf is this largest ice shelf in the world, it has the size of France, and it sits um, just adjacent to West Antarctica because it's fed by West Antarctica, and so a, a large proportion of West Antarctica drains into the Ross Ice Shelf and from there into the ocean. Roosevelt Island is covered by ice, it's accumulated locally there, the Ross Ice Shelf flows around it, but it's completely covered under snow and ice. It's quite a large island, it's about 150 kilometres long and it's about 60 kilometres wide. And you just see it as an ever so gentle white hump in the middle of nowhere. And as you land, you suddenly feel rather small because it is just white all around you, white in the horizon, white and flat. One of the aspects that make Roosevelt Island such a good place to study ice course is that there's a lot of snowfall. So the weather at Roosevelt Island can be quite changeable. You can have one moment, beautiful sunny days, um, all you see is a white horizon um, with a blue sky on top of you. And within hours, you can find yourself, actually within minutes, you can find yourself in thick fog where you only find the next um, tent by following a flag line that we put, put between all tents. So we have about 30 tons of equipment that we bring onto Roosevelt Island. Many flights are necessary for this. These planes have skis to land on and they land on a skiway. Um, once they land, each plane is met by a crew and their crew will help to offload the plane. We use sledges and skidoos to move the equipment around. So everything is lined out, flags are being put into place and we're creating long rows of equipment so that we can find it up a big snow snowstorm, food and fuel and other things to support us for our four months stay there. To be able to continue to drill throughout um, storms and other weather conditions, we have a drill tent that was specifically designed by Alex and Darcy, our two engineers. So this drill tent is 27 meters long and it is our home for the entire time period to, for the drilling operations. The drill tent itself is only about um, two meters high and to accommodate the drill um, activity underneath it we have to cut a four meter deep trench underneath the tent. So we're using chainsaws to outline the area of the drill trench and then cut four meters down. Then the drill is set up, the core processing accessories are being set up and then directly in the place where we're drilling we also need to cut a third or five meters into the ice, so a total of nine meters where the drill mast will swing up and down during the drill operation. So our drill was built by Darcy and Alex. Um, it is based on a long proven Danish design that was given to us by our Danish colleagues. And then they used some modifications to adjust it for the particular conditions that we expected at Roosevelt Island. So the particular achievement of this drilling system is that we got extremely good core quality throughout the entire, um, throughout the entire drilling process. So the drill is called an electromechanical drill and what it means really it is three knives at a round disc that are spinning around and it's a little bit like your hand drill when you drill a hole into the wall but instead of just making a hole our drill creates cuts a ring and leaves the piece in the middle the core intact each time we send the drill down the drill goes down on a wire it cuts another two meters into the ice and leaves the middle bit, the, the core inside intact. We then break the core and bring the core up on a winch all the way to the surface again. When the drill comes to the surface, the mast goes from vertical and lays horizontal. Now we can extract the inner barrel that contains the core and then the core is being pushed out onto the processing table. So when it is on the table, the drillers hand over the core now to the core processing team. 
the core processing team fits the, the core that just be, has been brought up to the previous piece and these normally fit perfectly together and then cut them into one meter length pieces. These one meter length pieces are now being packed into ice core boxes. These need to be kept at below minus 18 degrees during the entire time period. During the summer we often experience temperatures that can be as warm as minus five or warmer even for some hours during the day. And so we have the storage cave, which is located four meters below the surface where we store all the cores. So the drilling occurred over two field seasons in Antarctica. Both of these field seasons took four months. During the second field season, we drilled from 130 meter depth to the bottom, which was at 764 meters, drilling 20 hours a day. So it's very important that these cores stay below minus 18 degrees temperature to maintain the integrity of the records that we are hoping to get from the ice. And so the ice needs to be kept cold at site, but then also during transport. And then even once they're in the plane, the plane switches off all heatings and flies higher than usual, it flies at 10,000 feet to allow for colder temperatures um, inside the plane. The ice then is stored at Scott Base until the ship arrives and starts its journey back to New Zealand. Here we are at the New Zealand National Ice Core Research Facility at GNS Science. The ice has arrived and our international collaborators are here with us to process and analyse the core. So each meter is taken from the storage freezer into our work freezer. Here we cut the core using a horizontal saw and this provides a good surface that is being cleaned to measure the electric conductivity. This is a first glimpse of the age of the ice. It provides a signal for volcanic eruptions and large climatic transitions. Then we cut now pieces for various analysis and one of these pieces is now being transferred into the ultra clean lab here. So we take each meter of core and we place it on the continuous melter. This continuous melter is an ultra clean surface. It is a copper melter which is gold coated. And as the ice melts through the melter, we're dividing the material into ice that came from the interior of the core and thus has never been touched or handled in any way is completely pristine and the outer section that has experienced the cut in the band source and has been handled by people. From this clean inner part of the core we then can measure a variety of analyses. So the analysis can be distinguished into three groups. We measure the gases, we measure the water and we measure the particulates in the ice. So here you see the water coming off the melter and it's being pumped through these tubes to one of the critical points in the melter system and it's called the debubbler. So you see this nice triangle, the water and the bubbles that are coming from the ice are being pumped into this triangle. The bubbles over to the, to the gas analyzer, a laser that measures methane concentration in real time. While the water follows gravity and flows downwards and is being pumped away into many lines, one of the lines carries on two vials while the other lines are going to seven other instruments to analyze this water directly for the content of black carbon, dust, conductivity, pH, water isotopes and calcium. By the end of the processing campaign we will have filled over 100,000 vials. Each will be analyzed and will contribute to our understanding of the climate behavior in the past. Each of these drops of water is so precious to us because it contributes vital information on how Antarctica will respond in a warming world. This is important because Antarctica's response has the potential to fundamentally alter global sea levels, which matters to everybody.